what's interesting is when I have the <coughs> monitor stacked this way and I have to get over to this monitor and I have to remember that I have to go all the way to the left to get over to that monitor and all the way to the right over here. It's a case where the visual doesn't match up with the direction. It's like, it's like I remember seeing a stove that I had where the burners were oriented like this on the stove, yet the, the dials were oriented like this. So like, what does this one control? Uh, it's much better if you can to make the orient them the same way. So it's an analogy. So three, pardon me? My stove is a, has exactly the same format as it did. But, but this, I, um, an icon on top of it, and it's like, um, which burner is connected to. Right, exactly. So that's my two second user interface uh, <laughs> lecture to sort of make a, make the, the things sort of like correspond to each other. All right. Um, there was something I confess I missed about this example. Um, and I want to spend a minute talking about that. And that is about the settings. And if you remember, last time we talked about the, the idea of activities and the activity um, or, or, um, the, the, idea of, the activity and the idea of a fragment. And we talked about how a fragment allows us to use the screen more efficiently because if we can break the application down into like components, then depending on our screen size, we could possibly show two things at the same time. Another real good example of that, by the way, is I wish I would have thought of this, is if you have a list that you can click on and go to a detail of the selected item. So you click on this and you bring up this that maybe shows a lot of information on it. Uh, you might have it the list and the detail and a fragment. And on a normal size phone, you might have it oriented like this, whereas you, when you click this, it opens up another fragment in that, uh, it, within the application. But you can then make it so that on a tablet, you could show the list in this section of the screen and the detail over here. So that's the idea of a fragment. It just allows us to be able to use the screen more efficiently and give more variety to the different screen sizes and really make them uh, count. I remember when I first got tablets, you know, and I first started playing with them. Some of the applications were essentially just the phone apps on a big, ta you know, on a giant tablet. All right, and well, you know, that's still cool, I guess, but. If, it's, if you have a tablet, you might as well take up the space that's available on the tablet. And one way to do that is by creating fragments of your application if there are different things. And this is a good example of that because we have a fragment for the settings and a fragment for the game itself. All right. The one thing I didn't catch last time was exactly how the settings work. And I think the reason I didn't get that is if we look here, this settings activity fragment extends preference fragment. So that's a different kind of fragment than the kind of fragment that the other one is. The game itself extends just a plain old fragment fragment, I believe. Yeah, just extends a fragment. Whereas this is 
a settings fragment or preferences fragment. Now, what does that mean, a preference, preferences fragment? In a nutshell, it's an easy way to create a fragment to handle your preferences. Because what we can do, if we notice in this, our preference, our settings activity, all it does is it displays our settings fragment. All right. And it loads the layout activity settings from over here. So the app doesn't do much at all. And the fragment really doesn't do much at all. All we do is we add preferences from resource and we point to the XML for preferences. And notice how those look a little different. They contain list preferences and multi-select preferences. These are mapped directly to the shared preferences. So we don't really have to do anything like we did um, in other examples to take and like store that in the shared preferences. Uh, I think it was a Twitter search. Um, we actually stored that stuff in the shared preferences. This because we're using an XML file and we are using um, we are using um, uh, a preference uh, fragment. This maps these directly to there, so it will default to this, and we can go and change it. And As we change it, the changes are mapped directly to the preferences. If you notice then in the main activity, we have a method that says if the shared preferences change, we create a preference change listener. So if the preferences change, that preference listener fires off. And what we do in a nutshell is, where's that at? Over here, on shared preference change, we essentially grab the preferences that have been changed and reset the game and start over. So there's not a lot of code in the, in the preferences uh, bit because a lot of that code is, is just handled by the fact that we made it a preference fragment. So that's not terribly exciting. So is that saying use the preferences XML instead of the memory shared preferences? No, it, it feeds it feeds the shared preferences and memory from that XML. So if you remember back to the Twitter one, the Twitter one we had code that like grabbed the different things from our XML file, from our layout file, and created shared preference stuff with that. Um, here, we actually use the XML file to specify what's going to get put in the preference file. Instead of an input. Instead of an input, right. The XML is what does the magic. Uh, and the fact that it's a, uh, uh, an activity, I'm sorry, a uh, preferences fragment. All right, so let's go to the game itself. And the game itself, there's some cool techniques that they use. Again, this is what I was sort of talking about last time. Not all the techniques in this are, you know, the point is not to learn how to do this flag game, but we might learn some good stuff from the code in it. Um, so if I was going to list the lessons from this, I would say, First lesson is the, the use of fragments. That's the main point of this one, is to understand how to use uh, fragments. 
Um, I guess the preferences fragment was a bonus in there as well. But now let's look at the actual code itself for the game. All right. Which, of course, is contained, I can't always keep looking in the wrong place, but it's contained in the main activities fragment, the bulk of the game itself. One thing that's kind of cool, you notice, is this toast. Um, toast is something that is uh, a neat little thing because it allows you to sort of pop up a little message that will stay up a certain period of time for your user to see. It's like an alert that you would put up in uh, an HTML page or in other programming languages you have things like alert dialogues. The difference is, is it doesn't stay up for a long time. Um, I would say use toast for things that aren't like of that high of importance. You're just sort of notifying the user in case they haven't noticed. So for example, in this case, If we change the settings, all right, look over here. You have to look pretty quickly. If I go and change the settings, oops. quiz will restart with new settings. It pops up there. So. If you didn't put that up there, you know, the user is probably going to notice it because it went back to question one. Uh, I now only have two buttons instead of four buttons or whatever I had and so on. But it's nice to pop up a little message that says that. So toast is how you can do that. All right. So. Let's look at the main activity fragment that has most of the work for this. We start off with a number of lists. And we have a set. What's the difference between a list and set in Java? Sets like a hash table. Exactly. It sets like a hash table. What do I mean by a hash table? Okay, so can you give an example of that? Uh, well, yeah, so if you well, had an address book and you wanted to look up somebody's information by a key by their name or something, okay. you wouldn't want to search a list, right? Because right. it would take a long time. So as long as you have a unique key uh, that you can provide, like a social security number or something like that, you can find the object book. Exactly. So a list is simply a list where the numbers are, where the values, I said numbers, I mean values, are stored sequentially. So they're stored in a specific order. You have your first element, second element, third element, fourth element, fifth element, and so on down the line. Typically it starts with an index of zero, but it's in sequence, all right? And you can read it, you typically read it in sequence. A Set is almost like having an index on it, where you can take and easily find something with um, with uh, a, a key. All right. So, for example, um, there might be a set for mapping country to country information. All right. There's a standard. Not in this application. I, I apologize if that's confusing because this also deals with countries. But in another uh, application, you might have something where the key is like a uh, the three-digit uh, nation code, two or three-character nation code. Like UK is UK, France is FRA, Spain is ESP, uh, Germany would be GER, uh, Japan JAP, China CHN, and so on. You have that three-digit standard code. I believe I was given the right ones. So if you have that, you can get the information about that nation or state or whatever. So that's what we mean by it. 
Um, typically with a list, you ask for something with a given sequence in the list. You'll say, give me the, um, give me the, the tenth element in the list. All right. Whereas with a set, you give a value for a key and it will find it using the value for a key. So in this case, our file name in quiz countries are lists. All right. And what's the difference between the two? Well, file name is a list of all the flag file names. And the quiz country list are the names of the, the, the countries that are in play for this particular quiz. Remember, you can choose regions on this quiz. So you could just say, I want Asia and Europe. So uh, it, it appears that flag file names would be the list of all of them. Um, countries list would be the list of just those countries that were in play. Region set are the world regions in the current quiz. Correct answers, total guesses, correct answers again, the number of guess rows that we have. Notice that the way this is written, you can ask for two, four, six, or eight. And if we look in our XML for the layout, for this fragment, there are four rows worth of buttons. Row one, two, three, and four. So one of the attributes isn't the number of buttons that we want, but how many rows we have. Okay, we have a randomize, we have a handler, use a delay loading the next flag, an animation, and so on. When we create this, we inflate the fragment into the container, we create our array lists, we grab our random generator, and we grab our handler, we create our shake animation, we grab our different things on the screen that we are going to um, manipulate, the controls we're going to manipulate. We grab each of the rows and we put them in an array so we can simply loop through those and show the number of rows that we want and so on. Now for each row in here, what we're going to do is for each row in that array of linear layouts, we're going to attach a click listener to it. So we're going to, click, we're going to attach the same click listener to each uh, of the buttons on there. We initialize the question number, we return view, and we start. This loop here? Yeah. That loop here assigns to every button, it assigns the listener. I guess I was confused whether it was a unique listener for each row. No, each row. All right, so we have this. This is where a drawing might help. What do we have in our layout? We have. Maybe I can see the code and draw at the same time. All right, we're looping through each of the linear layouts. We have, let me write over here, we have four linear layouts, each with two buttons. We have to give each one of these a listener, right? So it does something when you click on it. So, we have an array of these linear layouts. And I'm just abbreviating, I'm not going to write the full variable names. But our array list is called Guess Linear Layouts. 
That's four elements. LL1, LL2, LL3, LL4. All right. This being element zero, being element one, element two, and element three. That's what we did up here. We assigned those to the elements in the array list. All right. And we only have four, fortunately, so we can hard code those. All right, not that big a deal. But we want to put those in an array so we can treat them all consistently. So, in other words, rather than having hard coding all over the place, that if you click button one, this happens, click button two, we have a little bit of a hard coding to put these guys in the array list, then we can do our looping magic and just treat them all as a unit. So what we're doing here is we're looping through each of these. So we do for each row, this is a slightly different syntax, but essentially that's going to each trip through the loop, we're going to look at the next row uh, in the array list, next element in the array list, which is going to be one of these linear layouts. All right. So for each of the linear layouts, we're going to repeat this for as many children are in this row. Now, as it turns out, there's two children in each row, right? We could have hard-coded that to two, right? But the problem with that is what happens if someone got the bright idea, let's put three guesses per row. Then they would have to go and change this, right? Or whatever. So for each row, it's going to look at each child. So there's a loop inside the loop. This is the outer loop. It's going to look at each row in turn. Each linear layout, this is looking at each child of that linear layout, which is what? Which is the button. Because each linear layout has two children inside it. This button and that button. Okay, so what are we doing for it? Well, we're grabbing this child and we're setting its on click listener to guess button listener. We then do that again, grab the second button, set in. So that takes care of this row. Then we do that in turn for each of the linear layouts. So when we're done, we have eight buttons. All of them have a listener of get button listener. They're all called the same thing. All of their listeners are the same thing. And does that prevent you from coding on more than one later? No. That's not the intent? No, that's not the intent. The intent of that is... The listener is, the listener, if we wrote separate listeners for each of these, they would be almost identical code. The only difference would be get the value of button one for button one's listener. Get the value for button two for button two's listener. But the rest of the process is going to be the same. Because what this does actually is, this is tough because we're, we, we kind of are um, jumping around a little bit, but actually the way these buttons get created wrong mouse the way these get, buttons get created, this name of the country is pulled off the button and that is used to see if they got the right answer or not. So every time there's a question displayed there's a right answer is stored somewhere. And these eight buttons are created. All right? When we click on a button, if we had different listeners, button one would say, give me the value of button one. Button two would say, give me the value of button two. Number three would say, give me the value of button three, and so on. So you have essentially the same code written eight times. So what do we do instead? We write our listener to say, give me the value of the button that got clicked on. Because we're going to get that click on event is going to get a target. And that target is going to allow us to differentiate between which button was clicked. All right? So let's actually look at that. Our but guess button listener is... is here.
All right, let's look at this private on-click listener called guest button listener is a new on-click listener. Now, notice what's an on-click listener have to have? Because an on-click listener is an interface, right? What does it have to have? It has to have an on-click method, right? Which this guy does. There's an on-click method because the on-click listener is an interface. An interface is a promise that this object, I'm, not, I'm sorry, that this class is going to implement a certain function or list of functions. Well, an on-click listener, the method that it needs is the on-click event. Uh, the on-click method. Notice what the argument of that on-click method is. A view of V. That argument is the exact button that gets clicked. That's what will allow us to use the same on-click listener for all eight of those buttons. Because we know which button got clicked, the one that gets passed into this method. So, We have our on-click listener with our on-click method. We click this button, and all of these are pointing to the same listener. We click this button, this button gets passed as an argument to this method. And then we can do anything we want to with it. We can disable the button, you know, because I think that's what happens. After you, after you choose it, I think it changes the color and disables it. We can get the name off the button to check to see if they made the right answer. We can do a whole bunch of things. All right, and that's what we're going to do. V is something that gives the country name or whatever. Well, V is the act. It's a button itself that got clicked. Right, that's the object. And that object has something. Exactly. And if you look, what does it have? Well, the text of the button is what it uses to get the country name. So. Did someone, did, was someone starting to say something? I think I get it. Okay, good. So, let's carry this through, though. Sure. We click this button. The button get whichever button we click gets passed into this method as the argument V. So, that's our guess button. We cast it as a button because we know, right? We stack the deck. We know that the only thing that's going to get passed to this guy is a button. So, we can cast it as a button so we can treat it as a button. All right? So now we get the value of the button's text. All right? And we get from this method, which we're not going to worry about right this second, all right? But this method, just trust us, gives us the correct answer. So in this case, I think this is Pakistan. So if we click that, that method is going to give us Pakistan. So we click that. We pass that button, which had a label of Pakistan. We call this method, which gives us the value of Pakistan. We increment the number of guesses. Then we look to see if the guess was equal to the answer. So if the label on the button, if the text on the button matches the correct answer, then, hey, we have a winner. So we do all kinds of things, right? We increment the number of correct answers. We display the, the country at, at the bottom of the screen. It verifies we got it right. We change uh, the color of something. I don't know. Um, we disable all the buttons. All right? And If the correct answers matches how many flags are in the quiz, we're done with the quiz. All right? Because remember how this works. If there's 10 flags in the quiz, the quiz goes until you get 10 correct answers. Now, it might take you 100 attempts to get the, the 10 correct answers, but that's what this is saying. Are you done with the quiz? Do you have the number of correct answers matching that? and then gives you the opportunity to reset the quiz and goes from there.
However, if they're wrong, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. This is not if they're wrong. This is if you're correct, but you're not at the end of the quiz. So let's see. That is... Notice it pauses, does the animation, and displays the next one. So it gives you, if you're not at the end of the quiz, and you got a right answer, it just sits there and waits for a certain period of time. And that's what this code does. And it runs the animation. We'll probably talk about this next week in more detail of why we do the delay this way. In a nutshell, we don't want to, we don't want your phone getting like locked up in, during this two second delay. So we actually create a thread um, to uh, do the delay. Now, if they got it wrong, what do we do? We run the animation on the flag. All right. That, shakes the flag saying, no, we didn't get it correct. We display incorrect. We set the color of the button to the incorrect button. So let's say that's Algeria. Does the animation and changes it to incorrect color. And then we can go and make a different choice. There, finally, I got it right. We got it right. Okay. So that's how the clicking of the buttons gets worked through. All right? That's how the clicking of the buttons gets worked through. We have a function that says what the correct answer is. We have the same on-click event for all the buttons. The on click event for that button, sees what button got clicked, grabs the text from it, sees if it's correct, and then does a couple of things, depending on whether that was the final question, not the final question, or we got it wrong. I think the last thing I want to look at this in this application is how it draws and how it creates the quiz to begin with, how it creates a quiz question to, to begin with, all right? Because what it does is it, will, it creates these questions, 10 of them, but it essentially applies the same process for all 10 of them. So let's look where we Create the questions as a load next flag. So and then essentially when we initialize the game, we set some of our things to zero and the counters to zero. We clear the list of, of uh, the array lists and so on. And then um, we go and grab the next flag. I was mistaken about what the quiz country list shows. The quiz country list doesn't show the name of the possible flags. It shows us the 10 that we actually selected for this quiz. All right. So the file list, uh, the list um, file name list shows all of the names that we could pick. So that is set based on the region, the number of regions that we have. Uh, the quiz country list is the actual number of questions uh, or the flags that we're going to ask the user for. And notice what this does. This goes in and it loops through for however many questions are in the quiz, randomly grabs the next 
uh, a random number, grabs from the file list that file name, and if that file is already in the list of quiz questions, it rejects it. So that way you don't get the same country more than once. So it's going to do this and it's going to form a list of, in our case, 10 countries. Now notice what it's going to give us. It's going to give us a file name. All right? It's going to give us a file name. The file name actually is going to be from the assets here, it's going to be the path that includes Africa, or it's going to be the file name Africa-Algeria.png. We use that in our get country name because it takes and gets rid of the stuff before the dash and only uses a country name. Now, so we grab the next image off of our list, quiz country list, and we actually remove it. So we remove the, the thing in, in position zero. We set our correct image to be the name of the image. So the correct answer is the name of the image. And remember, it includes the dash. Answer text view, we set the text to blank. Answer number, we increment that. We grab the region from the next images first part of the name. All right? Remember, the file name contains the region, dash, and then the country name. So we have to grab the actual flag now, the flag image. So how does it get the flag image? First, it needs to know what folder it's in. That's the region. So it grabs and parses this file name and grabs the first part of it, which is a region. It then goes and it tries to input, create the image from an input, input stream that includes a region, a slash, and then the name of the image.png. So, for example, if Algeria was chosen, what would this code do? Well, it would grab the region by parsing the file name, which is africa-algeria.png. And it would grab everything from the beginning of the file name to the dash. And that would be Africa, right? Which corresponds to the region. We're then going to open the file that's in the region folder, slash, and the file name is the nation name of uh, region name dash nation name dot png. So that's going to go and grab the actual image for that. All right. So now we have our flag image view, which contains the flag that corresponds to the right answer. We're now going to shuffle up all of them files that are in the file name list. So these are all the other files that are in play other than our selected file. Depending on whether there's two, four, or six, two, four, six, or eight buttons, we loop through this and we go and we set the country name to the country name from that we've randomly selected. So we already have our flag displaying. We go and in this case we're going to grab eight countries. We're going to get the country name from our 
array list here. We're going to do it either again two, four, six, or eight times. We go and we set these buttons with names from eight of the countries in the country list. Okay? So at this point in time, we're showing the flag of a nation, and all of these have wrong answers in them. Because we're grabbing, again, two, four, six, or eight nations from our file name list, and we're setting the text of the buttons to the name of the country. And again, that's what we're doing here. We loop through for as many rows as there are, and for each row, we loop through two columns to do this button and that button. And we simply set the button's text to whatever file name we get from the file list. Remember, we've shuffled that collection. So we're just grabbing the top eight things from there, assuming we have eight buttons like we do. So we're not randomly generating any of these numbers. We sort of are randomly, but it's not like we're randomly picking eight of them. We're shuffling it, then picking the first eight. And if you haven't written the blackjack code already, a statement like this is something that you can do to your array list to shuffle it, to shuffle your deck. Once we have all eight of these set with a country, all right, we're going to plop in and replace one of them with the correct answer. So we randomly get an integer for what row. We randomly get a column. We grab the linear layout that that belongs to. We grab the child name that it belongs to, and then we set that button to the right answer. So in this case, I think this is Taiwan. So initially, there were eight wrong answers here, and yet we knew the answer was Taiwan. That was held in this next, uh, um, this is held in the uh, country name. Uh, or, I'm sorry, held in the correct answer variable. We randomly pick which row and which column we want to replace, and we replace one of them. So we deal out eight wrong answers. We then find a place to put the correct answer, and we pop that in there. And then it's ready to go. Now, the only other thing we need to worry about is how we create that file name list, and we do that whenever we reset the quiz. The quiz is reset, if you remember, when we start out a quiz. It's also reset if we change our shared preferences. And all we do is we loop through each region, and for every region that we have selected, we go and we grab a list of all the country image names that exist in that folder. And we get rid of the .png on the name. So if I were to pick just Africa as the list, my file name list would contain all of the file names that are in Africa. If we picked Africa and Asia, then it would contain all the file names in Africa and all the file names in Asia. The interesting part of this, I think, again, first and foremost, is the way that the fragments were used. That's probably the most important lesson of all this. The preferences fragment, I guess, is pretty cool, too. The other thing that's cool about this is sort of how they use the same listener on all of the buttons. 
to avoid having duplicated code. The other part that's cool is how it used the naming conventions of having a folder for each region and the file name having the naming convention of the folder dash file name. Whoops. What's going on here? The file name having the convention of the region name dash country name. How this app sort of use that configuration convention to make its life easier. All right. So it forms a file list that only contains these names. All right. And then it can use the name plus the country in the file list to actually pull up the actual flag if that's one of the selected flags. Any question on this? Is there any piece of this that you would like to see me break out? We had talked about last time about um, these applications being very big and possibly having smaller applications that maybe just demonstrated one aspect of this. Is there a particular piece of this application that would like to see broken out, like I did with the menu last time? If you, th if you could think of that, let me know. Because um, I'm going to look at the next thing. The next thing I think we're going to tackle is actually doing database interactivity. So we can, uh, the, the shared preferences of, is a very simplistic way to have stuff, uh, have persistent storage. Much better is with a relational database. And yeah, it's more flexible, you know, you have more power and so on. But again, that complexity uh, and flexibility comes at a cost and that is that it's a little more complex than this. Questions? Probably not until I look at the okay. exercise. All right, sounds good. All right, that's all I have. We'll see you over in lab.